Let's talk for a moment about the electrocardiograph, the machine that gathers ECGs, and the electrocardiogram, which is the graphical representation of the electrical activity of the heart. So before we start interpreting ECGs, it's important to have a basic understanding of how the machine gathers that information and what it's showing us. The electrical activity, which is outlined really well in the osmosis video about ECG basics, shows the demonstration of how electrical activity moving through the heart, the electrophysiological activity, is perceived by sensors that are out on the skin. And so the terminology that we use here is kind of important just to keep things straight. The first is the term ECG or EKG. EKG is just from the German spelling, the original spelling, and you will still, still see references both directions, both ways, ECG and EKG. People that have been doing this for a long time, like myself, just automatically flop back and forth and can't seem to keep it straight. It doesn't matter. In ECG, EKG, the terms are interchangeable, but ECG is the more widely used one these days. The equipment that we use to gather data starts with electrodes. When we're talking about electrodes, those are the actual pads that are put on the skin. So it's an adhesive pad that contains conductive gel. It's an important to note that the conductive gel is in the center and is separate from the adhesive. So dried out ECG leads, for example, can give you poor signal because the gel, the conductive gel has dried out. But most of the ones that are designed for field use have phenomenal adhesive. And even if they've been dried out, even if they're not capable of transmitting electricity, they still stick really well. So the fact that the electrodes stick to the skin isn't a great indication of whether or not you have a good conduction. But it is one of the factors is you need to have a good contact to get an accurate tracing. The other term we use is leads. We talk about ECG leads. And so sometimes that's used to refer to the cable itself that you're connecting to your patient. More often when we're talking about ECG interpretation, we use leads to identify which view are we using, which electrodes are is the monitor looking at at any particular point to decide what's going on with electrical movement through the heart. Within those leads, we talk about multiple types. We have bipolar leads, which just have one positive, one negative. Um, examples are the limb leads, so leads one, two, and three. We're just looking from arm to arm, arm to leg, different views, which will be de demonstrated in um, a couple of images here. Um, we use lead two as the most common for simple rhythm interpretation because it's aligned fairly well with the direction the heart sits in the heart. So if our hearts are beating following a normal typical conductive pattern and our heart is in slightly on the left side of our chest where it is in most people, then most of the electricity is traveling roughly from your right shoulder to your left hip. So in the lead two, we're looking at a view from measuring the electrical activity from the left leg, measuring how much electricity is coming towards that left leg from the right arm. And that's why most lead two views, you have a nice big positive deflection of the QRS because the biggest electrical activity is moving in the direction that we're measuring. So when we look at our leads and our options, we have Eindhoven's triangle, which is sort of this imaginary inverted triangle, and it doesn't line up exactly, as you can see in this diagram. They show the left leg in the about the point of the belly button. But it's a good approximation that if we're measuring electricity from the right arm, essentially the right shoulder to the left hip, it aligns pretty well with the alignment of the heart. And from the left arm to the left leg is more vertical, not quite in alignment. Each of those gives us a slightly different view of the same electrical activity going on in the heart. Another thing to pay attention to is the machine and the paper, the paper that comes out. These are very um, standardized. The machine leaves, or excuse me, the paper leaves the machine at a constant speed of 25 millimeters per second. You don't need to remember that, but it's important that the machine does that accurately to get accurate representations as we're looking at the strip. Each square is just that. They're squares. So there's little squares and there's big squares. Squares are a millimeter. The big boxes are five millimeters. But we look at them and we use them differently. The key is that running left to right horizontally across the ECG tracing, we're measuring time. So we measure it in tenths of seconds. So each little box is 0 0.04, four one hundredths of a second. Five of those, which is a big box, is 0 0.20, so two tenths of a second. So five of those big boxes is one full second. So we always look at those boxes knowing that as we look at them moving across from left to right, we're looking at a representation of what's happening over time. When we look at the boxes vertically, 
Again, they're one millimeter in measurement, and that's the reference we use. We simply describe it as a number of millimeters above or below the baseline. What we're measuring and what we're describing is amplitude, how much the waveform goes either above or below the baseline. And that becomes very significant later when we're doing 12 lead interpretation and looking at multiple leads. For right now, it's not as critical in the rhythm interpretation that we're talking about, but it's an important thing to start paying attention to. When we refer to ECG waveforms, we're talking about any movement away from the baseline or the isoelectric line. So that flat baseline on your ECG where things would be if nothing is happening is the baseline. And then any movement away from that is considered a waveform. If it goes up above that line, we consider it a positive deflection and it shows us that the electricity is moving towards whatever electrode we're viewing this action from. And if it moves below the line, it's called a negative deflection already be familiar with the cardiac cycle at this point and how that shows up on an ECG, but here's a quick review. The P wave is the first complex we look at. It tends to be upright, rounded, and fairly small in comparison to other portions of the, of the overall complex. This is a reflection of the SA node firing as well as contractions of the atria. The next thing that we measure is the PR interval, and that's measured from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS. Normal PR interval is anywhere from 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. In other words, it should be between three little boxes and five little boxes in width. That represents not only that atrial depolarization, the P wave that we just talked about, but also the pause. And that pause is, as you remember, we talked about what happens at the AV node. The AV node filters impulses, allows time for the atria to empty their contents into the ventricles before that impulse is transmitted down through the ventricles. The next thing we come to is the QRS complex. And we use the term QRS to describe the main large complex whether or not it has a Q, an R, and an S. It doesn't always have all those components. The Q wave is the first negative deflection or downward deflection. The R wave is the first upward deflection and usually the largest deflection seen in leads one and two. And the S wave is the downward deflection that happens after the R wave. What we're looking for when we look at a QRS complex, one of the key things is we're looking for width we want to know if it's wide or narrow. And wide is defined as greater than 0.12, or in other words, greater than three small boxes. If it's less than three small boxes, we can assume electricity is moving rapidly and appropriately through the ventricles. If it's wider than 0.12, that means it's moving slower. It's moving slowly, which makes us suspect that there's a conduction issue, a conduction defect, or even, depending on the overall rhythm, that this rhythm might be originating from somewhere below the AV node and producing that white complex. Following QRS is the ST segment. This is what we focus on in 12 lead interpretation. And for right now, it's good to get in the habit of observing it. It starts at the end of the QRS complex, and it ends at the beginning of the upslope to the T wave. And sometimes the beginning and end is very clear and easy to define. And sometimes it's very challenging to decide what you think is the start and the end of that ST segment. We measure it to see if it is above or below the baseline. That gives us clues of ischemia or infarct. But it really is only useful when we're using a 12 lead. And we'll get into that later. The T wave is the final part of the complex. It represents repolarization of the ventricles, the ventricles resetting and preparing themselves for the next uh, impulse that comes along. Last waveform that I'll mention briefly is the U wave, which has zero clinical significance and you will rarely see it. It doesn't show up in all leads. Matter of fact, it rarely shows up, but in some leads at some times you may see evidence of a small wave that follows the T wave. And it's not even entirely understood or agreed on what is causing it, but it does not have clinical significance. But sometimes it may explain why you're seeing an extra small waveform on your tracing.